Hi, I'm Shane in Sweden, and in this uh, series of presentations, we're looking at how we can investigate a simulated uh, data breach on a website using Splunk. Now, in our last part, we looked to see if we could find uh, any traces of reconnaissance, which we did. And in this part, we're going to look at both delivery and exploitation. Now, if you watched the first video in this series where we discussed the cyber kill chain, you may be wondering why we're dealing with uh, delivery and exploitation. What happened to weaponization? In the last video, we did reconnaissance, and now we're going directly to delivery and exploitation. Well, the reason we're not discussing weaponization is that it's something that happens externally outside of our network. And as such, it's not something we can use Blunk to help us analyze or detect. And since this whole series is focused on how we use Splunk to investigate. We're not going to discuss weaponization in this series. So as we discovered before, we have two suspicious IP sources, 148.42 and 63.114. Now, 148.42 carried out a wide variety of attacks and 114 seem to be carrying out a lot of traffic against the administrator the administrator web page of our Joomla content management system and as I said the administrator page is where the administrator logs in and indeed we saw from the form data that there seemed to be a lot of username and password combinations there but we need to confirm that this was exactly what was happening and even more importantly, did it succeed or not? So that's what we'll be looking at in this video. One good way of exploiting web server is through web traffic. So why don't we have a look and see what our web traffic looks like. And to do that, we're gonna use our HTTP source stream. And we know what our destination is our web server 257 and let's just have a look at the can't by source let's run that query now we're getting one internal address here which we don't want so let's do a search to remove that Okay, so we've got two web addresses. Now, the question is, how are they interacting? There's several ways of interacting with a web server. Um, so if we look at the HTTP method, now we can see that the, the 114 is using get and post, whereas the 42 is mostly doing post. And then I guess the scanner is probably trying these other uh, verbs to see if any of them work. Now, if we have a quick look at what they're posting, first off, we will start with our 42. And if we can just get some quick stats on that we want to see what sort of urls it was calling and we'll sort by minus count we can see that the main component it was trying to do was by through the search form so we can have a look at what sort of information it was posting there. If we set the URI path, and let's look at what it was posting. So the HTTP method is post. And let's use the table command to pull out the form data. in a tabular format. Well, 
Well, it looks like a lot of searches, but you can see here, for example, it's trying to do some sort of injection attacks there. And so what was it doing against, there was another URL that was also popular, and that was against the index URL, the main web page. So let's see what it was trying to do there. And you can see it's also trying to do a number of uh, injection attacks. Okay, so we can see that the 42, 148, 42 seem to be engaging in injection attacks. Uh, let's try it from the other IP address, 114. And we're getting no traffic. This is the main page of the CMS, but of course, uh, as we saw previously, the attacks from this IP address were coming against the administrator's page. Let's just remove that for a second and let's do this URI path. Uh, as we can see, this is the uh, URL being used by 114. Okay, so we can see that posting traffic here is uh, lots and lots of different attempts to try different usernames and passwords. Uh, the question is, did it, did it succeed? Uh, let's have a look at what just what usernames and passwords were being plucked at. Now we can use, to do this, we can use the uh, regular expression in Splunk. There's several actually, uh, we're just gonna use Rex here. And we want for our Rex field, we're going to use our form data. And we can see we want the password text. We want to match on this. And it's equal to, that's the bit we want to capture. So we'll put that in parenthesis. And the capture we're going to name to user password. And let's see if this works. If it'll match on the uh, type of, of strings we're getting here. Hold on, let's take away the table. Command. Sorry, let's try that now. Okay, it certainly seems to be matching. We're getting plenty of events. We can pull out our new field that we've created using the right expression match, user password. Okay, and so we can see the uh, number of different password being tested by our brute force adversary. We can see the different passwords being, being attempted here. Now, we may want to look at what was the first password. In Splunk, there's always a field called time, which is created when you index data. Let's plug out our form data, which we know contains the word username and it contains the bit password. So I'm gonna stick our password. Okay, and if we look at the time variable again, take out the table, time and form data. And if we sort that on time, right, and so we can see the first password used is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. So we know what the very first password was. Now, if we go back to our regular expression, so we're plucking out our passwords. So we're just going to do reverse and we're going to pull out just the passwords. Uh, and we're getting lots of empty space here because some of the passwords may be sent in empty. So let's just make sure we are not looking at empty text. Um, to do that, we'll set user password is equal to star, so we don't accept any empty text. Okay, we can see we started with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight.
and we finished with rock. So it's sending all these passwords to us. The question is, did it work? Obviously, once they've discovered a password that works, they will use it uh, several times. Whereas passwords that don't work, they'll only be used once. So if we pull out our passwords here and we do counts, and we reverse the sort order, And we can see that no password comes with a count of more than one. But this might be because we're choosing only as our source the machine the brute force attack was coming from. There's no reason to assume that once they've discovered the correct password, that they would carry on using that password from that machine. So if we broaden our search and take away that as a source and search again, here we can see we've got a password which comes up in two different occasions. And you can always confirm this uh, password, but we can assume at this point that the brute force attack worked and that they gained access to the account. Um, if we go and look at the events for these two occasions, you, we can see that the, uh, switch to smart mode. And we can see why we couldn't get a double count from the same IP address because the password was used from two different machines. So this has answered another question that we had. What was at least one method that was successful in their attack? And we know that the brute forcing of the password and username was uh, successful and that indeed they identified the correct password from this machine and that it was used this machine. So this is the end of our exploitation phase. The adversary has now successfully exploited a vulnerability in our web server and has gained access to the admin site. And so in our next part of the video, we will look at what happens after they gained access. Now, the question is, of course, how uh, should we have prevented this type of attack? Well, we could have introduced a delay so that after a number of unsuccessful uh, login attempts, the system would not accept any more. Uh, logins for a period of time. Another possibility is to just disable logins from remote IP addresses. And a good situation here would have been actually, since we have Splunk and we can create alarms and uh, dashboards, to create an alarm that is generated after a number of uh, unsuccessful logins. Anyway, that's the end of this exploitation part, and I hope to see you in the next part of this series, where we will, of course, look at installation the next step in the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain.